It's the morning of the 26th. The police were searching the house. That's when they opened the door to the wine cellar and saw her covered in her favorite white blanket. It was the biggest thing to happen to Boulder in a very long time. My name's Hannah, and I'm auditioning for the role of JonBenet Ramsey. Do you know who killed JonBenet Ramsey? I'm auditioning for the role of John Ramsey. I'm auditioning for the role of Patsy Ramsey. OK, people, here we go. Patsy Ramsey was a beauty pageant queen herself. John Ramsey was a very successful man. There have been many stories about who killed John Bonet. There was so much speculation. He was in John Bonet's bedroom. It was a three-page ransom note. It still haunts me. There was a Santa Claus that was at the party. Ho, ho, ho. This is why I have a background check every year. In cases like that, it's always somebody you know. Good girl. The mother had to do it. Why would she have no motive? And then her husband. I think he's the innocent one. Actually, the son. There's no way a nine-year-old could pull off a murder like this. If you tell someone a secret, it's no longer a secret. Kill my daughter. In order to act, you tell the truth. All I have to do is think about finding just a little body and her little light Mommy. not being there anymore. for being here, guys. Congratulations. I, I love this film so much. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, let's talk about where it all started for you. We seem to be in this cultural craze of recreating moments, uh, tabloid moments that happened in the 90s, be it OJ. I think there's an LA Riots documentary coming out soon. Um, OJ had like five pieces, I think, that came out last year. And Jean Benet, I believe there's other films that are being made right now as well. I'm, I'm not sure, maybe another Lifetime movie. But where were you coming from in, in in going about this? Why the Jean Benet case and why this method? I'd, I've had like a strange fascination with this case since I was a kid in Australia and I'd never seen beauty pageants before so it was all very foreign to me. Do you guys not have beauty pageants for children in Australia? No, well maybe now but definitely not in the 90s. So I was like, it, it was something like I'd, I had never seen anything like this. It was very uniquely American and I'd grown up on American sitcoms so I had this very idealized view of what every American family was like. So this kind of shattered that view that I had. So I had this... Uh, that kind of, the case stuck with me and every, you know, every time I met someone from Colorado for the next 20 years, I'd ask if they knew who killed JonBenet Ramsey. <laughs> Do you know JonBenet Ramsey? <laughs> yeah, exactly, basically. Um, but yeah, so that, and in the end, um, yeah, those sort of elements came together. I had the opportunity, I made a short film that used a similar concept, you know, it was a casting tape film. So I had, from that short film, I was, I had the opportunity to make a larger feature and the JonBenet Ramsey case fit that kind of structure, so yeah, that's where we And where did that concept come from, this sort of casting tape uh, telling of, of the story? Um, I was working in Ukraine during the conflict, actually, and I was looking at a way to talk to women and children about wartime in Ukraine and to get some, and also I had this, it's kind of a crazy story, I had this, this image of Oksana Bayul, the figure skater, winning the gold medal that used to sit on my desktop, like, screensaver and she's crying but she looks like she's in pain but she's won the gold medal but she's got so much pain in her, like her expression so I wanted to recreate that so I got little girls to come in and recreate this image and while they were there they started opening up about war and everything that was going on in their own lives and I found it was kind of an interesting way in like a different way in to talk about a larger sort of larger themes um, so but with yeah. this though you're not talking about you're not talking to people specifically involved in the Jean Benet case you're talking to actors who are trying to portray people involved in the case so where did that element come from yeah so we held open casting calls across 
Boulder, Colorado and the surrounding areas and ask people to come down and just give their thoughts on the case and to be part of a movie. And we, we told them it's an experiment. It's something different. It's not like any other movie. It's not like the Lifetime Jean Bonnet movie. Um, but you're, you're, and also your casting tapes will be used in the film and multiple people will be cast, not just one. And this is a strange film. Do you want to be a part of it? And people were kind of excited to be a part of it. You know? How devastated are the people who didn't have their tapes used? Like, oh, God, I can't even get picked for... Th I'm rejected by this. Everybody got picked on this one. Well, there's 200 people that we auditioned. There's 72 in the film. So there's 128 people who are really mad at me. Miserable. Right yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, they've quit the biz at this point. Exactly. Uh, James Scott, I mean, these guys are legendary independent film producers right here. They've made some of the best films ever made. What attracted you to this project? Because I thought it was going to be one of the best films ever made. <laughs> period. I mean, Kitty Green. It, it's, this thing is crazy. It's like an experimental art house, experiment, crazy docu-fiction hybrid. But it's the most insanely entertaining and disquieting and disturbing and moving movie I've been involved in in years. So it's, it, it really cuts across the culture. It speaks to a mass audience, but it also speaks to a mass audience with an enormous amount of integrity and intelligence. So you really, you can watch this thing and be completely riveted and then your mind will, we, we've been watching the tweets today. It just landed on Netflix today. So uh, the tweets are coming in and people are doing things like, my head is exploding, you know, that kind of thing. So we're, we're very gratified. It's quite, it's quite an experimental film, and to be able to do something that you know takes some risks and takes some chances in form, but then do it and get it out to a mass audience with a subject matter people are compelled by, uh, it just it was something I was instantly attracted to. Now, obviously, your Joan Bonet and her family were people who I don't want to say craved attention, but she was in beauty pageants as a child, so clearly they were enamored with her and with the attention that she would receive through beauty pageants. And you're also working with actors who more often than not are enamored with the attention that they could receive for being on, on camera. Was that part of the initiative of, of, did you see the parallels there with these two, these two stories? Oh, definitely. I mean, the themes that we're exploring are about, definitely about kind of this, well, we're actually looking at more than anything, this kind of cultural obsession with Jean Benet Ramsey, the mythology and legacy of Jean Benet Ramsey. And cultural obsession with beauty and, and exactly. cinema and television. Exactly, and that relates into why this story became such, like why is she still on the cover of magazines 20 years later? And that's partly because the, the media had all these image of, images and video of her that they could just use for 20 years and recycle and just put on every show. I think there's been hundreds of, books and crime specials and TV specials and she just... Still going. It's, yeah, it never ends. So that's partly... We were trying to almost close the book on it and go, there's no way to solve this case. Let's move forward. Now talk about sort of taking this experimental form and actually turning it into, turning it into something that could also be thrilling as just a, a narrative entertainment. There is stuff that you did that makes it feel like you are watching a thriller. Well, yeah, we have this... We have cinematic, it's sort of a mix of documents, it's mostly documentary, it's mostly real stories from real people, but we do have this room for like cinematic pieces and scenes that are really kind of lush and gorgeous and feel like you're watching like a Lynch movie or something. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of really key to us to kind of push that experience. So it doesn't just feel like a documentary, it feels like something different. It sets itself apart from other documentaries in that way. Was he kind of your calling card that you referred back to while you were making the film, Lynch, where you were like, let's make this feel a little more Lynchian? Eh, it was sort of weirder than Twin Peaks, this case, in a lot of ways. But also, I mean, I think it was like between... It was so we sit in our own bubble. We're like between toddlers and tiaras and Lynch and Fargo and the act of killing them. We sit in between these kind of a mix of things. We're, we're, we're a bit of a different project. Right. James, is this the first documentary that, that you've produced? No, I've had the opportunity to work on a few documentaries in my time. I used to run a company called Focus Features, so we made a lot of big, big, um, you know, uh, art house movies, Brokeback Mountain and Crouching Tiger before then and stuff like that. But, um, but I did, uh, when I was at Focus, uh, got involved with a, a movie uh, which is as pure a documentary but also as crazily weird. You can get it called Babies. Um, it was a movie that just had babies in it for like an hour and a half, just babies. Uh, and for whatever reason, that was a big hit that year. It was kind of the, uh, 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 and it's still, and it's online, I'd say check it out, because Cash and Jamine will be so freaky, and babies is freaky in its own, like, really cute way. It'll be like, yin and yang. I think that both of you have produced films that have expanded the form, and have also sort of just been contained within the form, and just been great standalone films. 
how difficult is it for you guys now to be able to put a project like this together to find funding and to be able to get it out there? Or have you found that Netflix and Amazon has actually given you a bit more of an opportunity to explore? Well, Netflix has been an amazing partner on this film. Um, and this film, like a lot of documentaries, you know, it came together in bits and pieces. So uh, Kitty went to Boulder and Denver, Colorado in the summer of 2015 and shot for eight weeks and got a number of interviews done. And then we put together a funding trailer. And then we have a lot of great funders. So in addition to uh, James's company, Symbolic Exchange, and Meridian Entertainment, we have Sundance, we have Cinereach, uh, Rooftop Films, like a number of people from the documentary community all came together to support this film. How did you get all those people together? Yes. <laughs> I, I don't have an answer. I mean, we had a, we had a, yeah. Just you. Just me. Just you. No, gosh. And, and, <laughs> you know, one thing about this film is that we're not competing against anything else. There's nothing else like this film. So I think sometimes in funding panels, it's like, oh, we're going to fund one film of, in this bucket of five. They're all about this topic. And this is a unique film. Like, we weren't competing against anybody. Kitty, when you're shooting these, uh, these actors uh, in Boulder, Colorado, these sort of local actors who are trying to portray uh, a grieving father or trying to portray uh, any, any one of these characters. How do you straddle that line of sort of letting the audience, showing the performance without making fun of it at the same time? Because so often there is a level of detachment between, there, is, there needs to be a level of detachment between the viewer and their performance. I think, you, uh, I think you close that detachment as you get towards the end of the film a little bit, but yeah. early in the beginning, you know, there's definitely an element where you can imagine someone watching it and be like... <coughs> yeah, but the idea is almost like we do have a bit of fun in the beginning, and, and the actors were aware of that. There's going to be some line flubs. There's some, some pieces that are sort of funny and weird moments, and it's such a dark, it's, it's such a dark subject matter that if we, it was all serious, I don't think anyone would be able to sit through it. So we did have these moments of lightness where... You know, we have a strange sex instructor who comes in. We have strange people that have walked just because it's an open casting call. Anyone can walk in. So there's like, we don't, we, it was a big surprise for us who would come in every day. And then, but the film gradually shifts tonally as it goes through. It has almost an emotional trajectory where it gets darker and heavier and more real and heartbreaking as it goes through. And by the end, they, they kind of kill you. They, they break your heart, our actors, because it's real. I mean, it's coming from real places. Every performance is coming from somewhere real, which is really... Well, they start real. really opening up to you about their, their own lives a, a little bit as well. Yeah, I mean, which was kind of natural, surprisingly. As soon as you sit someone down and say, what do you know about the Ramsey case? I was, the most surprising thing for me was immediately they went straight to their own lives. Well, my mother has bipolar disorder, so Patsy must have done it, and then well, we have a story. What's so weird about that is that these are also people trying to get a part to a degree, right? So there's an element of their own self-exploitation there where they're willing to, sure, it's, a part, it's partially vulnerability, but it's also partially kind of like, well, maybe if I tell this person about the time that I was sexually assaulted or molested, like they'll feel like I'm more close to this role and to this project. Maybe if we were different filmmakers and we didn't clue them in, but these people knew what the project was and that this project is about a community and its response to a tragedy as opposed to being do you want to get the part? Do you know what I mean? So I don't think anyone felt compelled to tell me a story to get a part. Also, they knew multiple people would be playing. I mean, we have 20 patsies in that final sequence. So it's not like people were eliminated based on the depth or whatever. How well, much I don't think you were do eliminating uh, people. Based yeah. on the no, I don't. They, they definitely, we were very honest Your about it. story isn't horrifying were. enough. Get out of here. Exactly. Uh, James, what do you think it says about us as a culture that we're... I mean, I don't know if other countries... It says nothing good. As a, uh, no. Well, it's just that we're fascinated with recreating these moments within... Uh, of, of murder, specifically murder, I think, of these horrifying, you know, murderous moments in our culture. We recreate them, and we're all very open to playing the parts all the time. I mean, uh, on the other hand, uh, when was the last time you were in 5th century BC Athens hanging at you with Euripides and Sophocles because that's what ancient Greek tragedy was doing with Medea and everybody else. Really horrifying, creepy stuff. It seems to me that's culture on the one hand. On the other hand, when we were making this movie, we had no idea that between the time Kitty began the film and ended it, we'd end up, for example, here in the States with a president who used to run beauty contests and kind of hung out in the locker room or whatever. I mean, it's like crazy, right? So, you know, that, that kind of drip down of just weird... Um, when you get to the local level and you're dealing with real people in a community that has lived with the mythology of this horrible crime for 20 years and everybody's been touched and then give people an opportunity to help craft something transcendent that comes out of that experience of living with that uncertainty and that horror, 
that's really unique. It's it's, it's special, um, and and it was it was really fun to see what Kitty was able to to kind of bring out through the process and lead to that end of the film that you talked about, where people are just decking you. Kitty, you know, from far away, I think we judge people who wrap themselves up in stories like this and talk about them all the time. But like James said, when you get to the local level, do you find that they are personally affected by them and it affects their daily lives? Or do you find that it's sort of just another story that has happened that we on the outside focus all this attention on? I think when you live on the ground near these things that you can't escape it. They're surrounded by press all the time. These stories are in the media all the time, on the radio. I mean, you you have to make sense of it in some way, and especially if it's an unsolved case and you have more questions than answers, of course you're gonna mull it over and of course you're gonna connect it to your own experience or try and make sense of it through what you know of yourself and what you know of your community. And so, I mean, we were looking at how people perceive events, essentially. How did you stage these sort of these interviews and these performances with them? Because you're definitely not recreating the exact scenes but you are putting them in a set that isn't, uh, you know, just like a flat office space that someone would normally do a, a casting session in. Yeah, we, we built very elaborate sets. So we would kind of, every little uh, character is auditioned on a set. And then these, we would build, we built like almost a replica of the house for these final reenactments. But it wasn't like we told, gave people a script. We had basically just like an outline, like, okay, Patsy comes home one night, but we let each character or each actor interpret it their own way based on their own experience or their experience, their knowledge of the case or however they wanted to go. It was all sort of up to each individual to do, to do their own thing once they got onto that set. Was it difficult for them to, to do a fair amount of this or did you find that they were open to it immediately? I think it was actually a cathartic experience, weirdly. It was quite therapeutic. It was nice to come together and discuss something that they've been thinking about and haven't really been able to escape for 20 years and to think about it in a new way and to kind of almost just be able to talk openly about how they felt about this or their own kind of problems or things that have connected to it. And in the end, I, I think we all kind of came together and did this huge experiment on a set together and it was it felt it's like a beautiful, beautiful kind of cathartic experience. So. How protective did you find that you were of their vulnerability by at the end when you started editing the film? Uh, I don't know. I always worry about them. <laughs> so I'm always conscious of how they're being perceived. So, Have yeah, a lot I mean, of them seen it? Yeah, they've all seen it, I believe. And most of them came to Sundance and we had a big group there. I think 45 or something drove out from Colorado. So that was fabulous to have them all there at the the big premiere. Um, but yeah, they, they've had a really lovely response to it. I think we kind of formed a beautiful ensemble group and we feel connected in some way. We feel it formed like a community within a community and there's something lovely about that. Is it a difficult process when you're editing something like this and you start to feel protective of their, their vulnerability but at the same time you're trying to put something together that has a thesis and a statement that it's, that it's gonna kind of make at the end of it? I mean, we're very aware that there's an emotional trajectory and we're aware of how we want the audience to feel at every given moment. I'm aware of who's willing to let us push the boundaries a little bit with what they say or how they say it. So, I mean, you just take, it's, you throw all that into the edit process and it's sort of very detailed, nuanced process, but you get there in the end. This is gonna, this is kind of a hacky question, I'm sorry. But uh, have you thought- I think of a very hacky answer. <laughs> have you thought about doing this with other, doing this kind of experiment with other cases? I mean, it doesn't have to be from the 90s, but I, I would imagine, I'd be curious to see a case that specifically is around, surrounding race, is, racial issues, how that would play out in, in, a, in casting sessions like this, how personal stories would be, would come out. Well, that's fascinating, but I don't know. I feel like the jig is up. I don't know. Well, can we trademark the whole thing and just kind of like, you know, do a format, sell the format to somebody? Yeah, yeah. Casting and then the thing. Casting and then the thing. Uh, let's get some questions here from the audience right here. Hey, guys. Um, I was wondering about the um, cast, the, the girls uh, that were going for the casting. Did they, uh, I guess, you know, they didn't know the story, uh, but... Were they told like what the what happened and or uh, the backstory and were their parents there or were there some things that you couldn't like uh, talk about with them? I mean, they're six or seven, so yeah, they didn't know anything about the story. I mean, we were I was in I mean discussions with the parents about what we were trying to do, and these aren't Hollywood moms; these are people in Colorado who 
have precocious children and are not sure what to do with them and they're into acting. And so, and they've all Googled me and checked out and made sure I was a feminist filmmaker and that they were in the right hands. And they're, they're good people. But um, yeah, one of them, I think, little Hannah, who says the first line in the film, it's actually in the trailer, who killed Jean Bonnet? Her parents couldn't figure out how she even knew that or whether someone had told her or Goog she'd Googled it. Like, there was an odd, like, yeah. So kids pick up on stuff, but that wasn't something that we intentionally fed anybody. But the, the parents were on set. Uh, the whole time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did they ask you questions, the the parents? Did they, did you find that the parents sometimes didn't understand the intention that you had or what exactly you were doing with the whole project? I don't think they would have been involved if they, unless they understood the intention. Like we were very clear and very honest with them because this is something, I mean, it's a provocative subject matter, so they had to be prepared for that. And luckily we found a group of people that understood the larger themes and what we were doing. So we were really fortunate. And for aspiring filmmakers out there, remember, don't, don't cast the child, cast the parents because you're going to be living with that for a long time and they're really, you have to make them your partners. Next question. Hi, um, I'm wondering as filmmakers, you must be very um, precious with the art that you're creating. So I was wondering how you deal with um, editing and like what goes in and what doesn't go in. Just, just for the record, Scott's very precious. I'm not, I don't really care. <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of ruthless. I just, I edit really, like, I'll just chop scenes out. I'm not that precious over the material. I, I, I don't know, especially with something like this where it's going on Netflix, I know people are going to be on their phones as soon as it gets boring. So you've got to kind of keep it moving forward. And they're actually on their phones while they're watching it. Exactly. Or they're watching it on their phones. Yeah, Who knows? Um, yeah, so, I mean, that was sort of my intention. And I used to work as an editor, so I kind of had a bit of that. I would, yeah. I would just like to say, don't watch this movie with your phone. It's, it's, it's very atmospheric and it's beautiful. And, like, you shouldn't take yourself out of the experience. It's one of the problems with with Netflix and watching things at our home or we have our phones is I find that even myself when I'm watching something and I have my phone out, I lose track of the atmosphere and the experience and it doesn't become a sort of a full meal and it doesn't become as satisfying. Yeah, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to get interest people enough so they don't reach for their phone. Like you want to keep them glued to the screen as opposed to checking Snapchat or something. Well, it's such a different intention that a filmmaker has to have or at least think about now that, the, that films rarely spend that much time in, in the theater. Yeah, but also, you know, then you have this thing that you, I mean, people are hip to, right? Which is, oh, they're going to grab you in the first three minutes with some scene with some shocking, sexual, violent, funny thing, and then you're supposed to be hooked, and everybody's now like, okay, I got through that, now is this really interesting? And I think what, what Kitty and filmmakers like her do is trust you. You know, we start off just the way we start off. This movie is just is what it is, but it, it, you just get drawn in. And I think that's why there's been the resonance and the response to it so far. Absolutely. I think audiences are also hungry for people to play with the form more so than more so than they are just sort of experiencing the same movies that they've that they've seen over and over again. Uh, next question. Hey, thank you for being here. Can you elaborate a little bit more about your experiences at Sundance? Wow, Sundance. Is this Sundance. your first time? Yeah, this is my first. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it. You know, back in the day when there was only. Uh, yeah, it was seriously though. It's weird for old folks like me to come to Sundance with a, a, a great new voice in cinema. But remember, 25 years ago when there was one theater and all the filmmakers hung out and there were no agents, managers, publicists, the whole t you know the circus. Um, and now there's gifting suites like you go to with the interview and then you walk through and they're like giving you free stuff uh, kind of thing. It's just a very weird experience. That said, the reality of the experience of Sundance for a film like this, when we had so many of the cast, the real people in the movie came to celebrate, made it totally different. It, it was not an industry event. It was an intense experience because they were seeing it for the first time with almost a thousand people and to your point, I know you use that word a lot, and you're so right, vulnerable. The people in this movie are very vulnerable, because we're, you know, I bet you there's some actors in the room here, um, just in the middle of the day, and we're in New York, so I'm assuming, <laughs> you know. Um, but, uh, you know, can you imagine your casting tapes? Those are just really vulnerable moments. You're just kind of flying blind. And everyone knew that some of that was going to be up there, and then we let it happen. So it was a pretty amazing experience. I did a casting tape once where I was asked about personal experiences, and I, re I was like, I'll never do that again. And it, like, I think a week doesn't go by where I wake up and I'm like, where is that tape? <laughs> Who has it, and where could it possibly go? It's terrifying. It's an incredibly vulnerable experience. How did you make them trust you? Like, what did you tell them? How did you make sure that they totally trusted you, that this wouldn't end up anywhere outside of 
a complete piece. I mean, I think we were just honest with them. It was all about honesty, really, and just being like, well, this is what the project is. Do you want to be a part of it? And it is, I mean, it was a, a project about a community. It's not, and we used, I mean, the yeah, sorry, that's the wrong word, but do you know, the, they understood the intention. And I think when you understand the intention and the power on that set as well, the emotional power of just that, which is the final sequence, but being on that set, it was heavy and it was real and it was raw and it was heartbreaking. We all came together and I feel like that experience is unforgettable. So we're holding on to that. Even though we're in this big machine now and we're being pumped into all these different countries, we're still our little group, which is pretty amazing. We had a really profound experience together. Uh, I think that's all the time that we have. Casting Joan Benet is uh, on Netflix today, right? Guys, congratulations. It's beautiful and creepy and weird and an amazing achievement. Thanks so much for being here. Thank Congrats. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.